So I feel like every time I talk about transparency, the situation seems to get a little bit more dire. And so what I mean by that is, you know, a couple years ago, I would be standing up here in front of you. We'd be talking about the Facebook news feed, and we'd be talking about how it's hard to understand why we're getting specific posts in our news feed, and that this is a big issue we need to be concerned about. But since then, I feel like the situation has gotten quite a bit worse. Now we're talking about things like predictive policing and its negative effects on a lot of communities. We're talking about learning analytics that decide who gets into university and once they get in, whether or not they should stay there. And so all of these kind of high stakes applications have led to different groups calling for algorithmic transparency. We see the ACM has called for it, kind of media outlets like Slate here are calling, saying it's time for more transparency. And also policymakers and think tanks are saying, we need to end secret profiling, we need more algorithmic transparency. And we see this in the literature also. So broadly under intelligibility, explanation, and transparency, we see people asking questions like, what should we show users? What questions will users ask? And even, you know, what kind of systems need transparency? From the more kind of machine learning communities, we see really kind of extensive work where people take models and they slap on some kind of explainability or visualization component, call it explainable, but don't really do a user test or anything to figure out if that's how people actually want to interact with it. And from our viewpoint, that's something that we feel like is kind of missing, is how do users want to interact with transparency? And I hope to speak to that a little bit today. And so we're going to ground this work in the domain of emotional analytics which we feel like is a very important domain. And it seems that users agree. So a recent study showed that stress and emotion tracking were the most requested personal informatics features. And there are tons of examples in both literature and practice. So for example, Moodkit and Wobot, Dailyo, these have millions of downloads within the App Store. These are widely used. But more importantly for what we're gonna talk about today, emotional analytics are actually kind of perfect for transparency research. And what I mean by that is, if you've seen talks about explainability and transparency at this conference, often they're using kind of toy systems that, um, toy systems and games that are kind of self-contained and easy to manipulate. But with emotional analytics, we have something that people actually want and that people are their own domain expert in. So it's very hard to test with these high stakes systems where we have to recruit highly specific domain workers and also use these systems that we can't modify at all. But with emotional analytics, we can modify the system and the user is their own expert there. If I tell you, you know, um, if you tell me about your day yesterday, you can tell me how you felt about it and you will be 100% correct there. And so if we make predictions about someone's emotions, they're the expert. And so this kind of leads towards this method that we have here, which serves as a test bed for transparency for us. And so this is the e-meter, which predicts mood from mood of different experiences from the text that people are writing. So in the example on the right here, you see this overall kind of simple meter moving from very low to very kind of high here, where the negative in the red is a negative mood, and on the right, the more positive green is positive. <laughs> That's redundant a little bit. Um, but either way, this is a non-transparent system right now, right? We're seeing these overall predictions and that's pretty much it. But we also have a transparent version of this system where in addition to seeing the overall prediction, we're highlighting the contribution of different features. So this is a global type of explanation or transparency. And we have this legend that then, you know, shows this is what all these different things mean. And so we're kind of basing this on different applications we've deployed in the past. So for example, we deployed this application Emoticow, which people track their moods and their energy levels, what activities they do, and they write a bunch of text. And so we're pulling this part out to experiment with it a little bit, and we want to put it back in. So this is the e-meter that I'm talking about. And so we used all the data here to train the e-meter. And the model itself is very simple. So it's a linear regression. We're using stem to unigram features and the mean absolute error is 0.95 on a negative three to three scale. So you're probably asking, why are you using such a simple model for these predictions? And this is simple on purpose, right? So if we're trying to figure out transparency 
and we can't explain a linear regression to our end users, how can we hope to make something like a neural network intelligible to our end users? So we're really kind of starting at the ground floor here and trying to figure things out. But also, in this domain, users have previously rated this simple algorithm as accurate. That's six out of seven on a Likert item for accuracy. So clearly for users with this application, it seems to be kind of good enough here. So the first question we're, we want to ask in this is, do users prefer transparent systems? And so our kind of method looks like this. We bring users in. They watch a video of both the systems. They use one version, which is transparent or not. They answer some questions. They use the other version. And then at the end, they take a survey, and they choose which one they would use if they had to use it again. Of course, this is randomized and counterbalanced because it's a within subjects procedure. Our user population, we recruited about 74 users from Amazon Mechanical Turk. We pre-screened them to make sure they were high quality workers, and then also post-screened the open responses to make sure that they were actually answering the questions. And for the qualitative part of this analysis, we had two researchers conduct a thematic analysis following Braun and Clark. So after the videos that they initially watched, it seems like users are stating a preference for transparency. They expected the transparent system to perform more accurately than the non-transparent system. And in our kind of data set here, accuracy and kind of preference within the systems are very highly correlated. So we take this as an implicit signal that users would probably prefer the transparent system having only seen the videos of it. But after they use the system, users are actually split in their preferences. So almost uncannily, 37 users chose the transparent system to use again, the other 37 chose the non-transparent system. This was a little confusing to us with, you know, kind of all these media and big outlets saying we want transparency and people seeming to agree. So what was going wrong with the transparency? Users described it as distracting. So one user said, the individual highlighting of the words was distracting during writing. I wouldn't have minded as much if I could turn it on or off. Other users called it things like annoying and obtrusive. Users also seem to look at the non-transparent system and overestimate the performance of it. So even though they saw both systems, users in the non-transparent system attributed things like the non-transparent system taking into account context of the words, which of course it was not doing, it was a simple unigram model. And so for example, this user said, I like the non-transparent version, it seems to focus on the whole and not each individual word. But, you know, kind of more along the lines of what we expected, just a smaller amount, the users who preferred transparency liked the increased system understanding that they got from it. So one user said, I think the transparent version provides more engaging feedback and helps me better understand the reasons for the amount it gave in the meter. So why do users have these split preferences for transparency? What about the experience they're having is leading to this? And so we followed up with study number two, which is a kind of in-depth interview with some people we bring into the lab. And this asks the question, what problems does transparency introduce? And so now, instead of always having the transparency on, we're adding this button that users can click. And it, the button itself is labeled, why am I seeing this rating? And the users, after they're done writing, will click it, and they can see what is going on um, with their uh, rating. And so we recruited 12 users from our participant pool. We brought them into the lab, and we put them through a procedure where we ask them some initial questions. We do a think aloud, and then at the end, we have a semi-structured procedure that we talk to them with. And this will follow the same qualitative analysis strategy, the thematic coding I outlined earlier. So what we found were three different problems with transparency. One of these was excessive transparency, which kind of clarifies the distraction result that we got earlier. Users felt that it wasn't necessary to highlight every word, so they felt that only big, emotionally heavy words should be highlighted. Another user said it's taking into account words like stressful and regretful and stuff, but then like everything else in between adds an extra layer that complicates it. Another theme we saw was this idea about kind of mistaken expectation violation, and this is where users mistakenly disagree with the system's predictions. And it seems that transparency reveals more data that the users can then disagree with. So an example of this is personal pronouns. 
If you've read stuff from Penny Baker or about emotional writing, you know that personal pronouns encode a lot of information about someone's mood. But the users didn't feel that way. If they saw a pronoun highlighted, they would say, that doesn't contain any information about mood. That should not be highlighted. And so there's this interesting disagreement there. And that kind of segues into the fact that transparency could contradict user heuristics. So users seem to build really simple mental models of the system's operation. For example, one that we saw often was that the predominant highlighting color of the text that the user is writing should be the overall color in the rating. But in actuality, in this toy example here, as you can see, someone who is writing about their pet a lot, but then says something that is very heavily weighted like death, all of that kind of gets canceled out. So it's clear that users aren't really understanding what's going on in the underlying model about how different things are weighted differently. So what do these results mean? We've essentially kind of built up this list of things that users built up this list of user needs around transparency. But it's not really clear how to build a system that will meet these needs. We had a kind of fortuitous interaction with a participant in the lab in the end of our second study. So this participant had already pressed the button where they said, why am I seeing this rating? They looked at all the transparency, and then they had this interaction with the researcher. They asked, can I click this again? Does this? And the researcher said, I don't think it shows any more than that, where the participant was then disappointed. And the researcher said, if you were to click it, what would you expect to see more about? The participant said, I want more bullet points to tell me why it works the way it does. So this participant, even though they've seen this transparency that others called excessive, is still asking for more information about what's going on in the model. And so it's clear that not everyone is really the same on this. Everyone has different mental models and they kind of need to be met where they're at. And this leads towards the idea of progressive disclosure. And so progressive disclosure is originally kind of uh, almost old school HCI idea that was applied within the Xerox star and early word processing systems about hiding kind of more advanced controls and information from novices. And the remote here is an example of that where on the left, we have a very simple remote where you can slide it down and this is like physical progressive disclosure to see all the kind of more complex buttons on the right. And so if we apply this to transparency, it would mean that transparency is no longer just a single interaction. Progressive disclosure would allow users to repeatedly kind of ask for, for more information as they need it. And so this would allow us to work in all these kind of different explanations that we've seen talked about this week at IUI. So for example, the first kind of explanation that the system could provide is something like a natural language explanation. The second would be highlighting you know, the most impactful features in this system. And then continuing on to you know, explore more about the features and provide even explorable explanations where people can dive in and tweak things to figure out what's going on. The nice thing is this meets users where they're at. If they're invested enough to keep clicking through this, they're invested enough to engage with the explanation. And it also fits really nicely within social science models of explanation. So Garfinkel would argue that explanations are occasioned. They're not needed all the time. Grice would argue that you only need to provide as much information as is needed, no more, no less. And progressive disclosure kind of meets these where they're at. And so the whole idea is we kind of pull out this aspect of the e-meter about the emotional writing, sorry, of this original application that we had deployed. We pull out the e-meter, the emotional writing component, and we think that now if we kind of apply progressive disclosure to the transparency there, we can put it back into the original application without really having negative effects on, for example, adherence or compliance. And I want to acknowledge that, again, you know, this isn't the most high stakes system. But what we're seeing here, these problems that I just talked about, we're already seeing this in major high stakes systems that we're testing with. So the learning analytics example we're studying this right now with domain experts, and it's almost uncanny how these results have replicated to the other domain. So it's clear that these are really kind of generalizable results. And also there's a methodological point here, which is walkthroughs and videos of systems are actually different than experiencing them. Remember how users watched a video, they basically said, I want transparency. And then once they used it, they said, whoa, hold up. Like, I'm not sure that's what I asked for. And also, there's something to be said for what influences preference for transparency. What is it about user characteristics? What is it about the stakes of the decision? 
the mental model state of the user, the context of the decision. There's a lot more to be explored here. I've seen some really interesting papers addressing some of these this week, and I hope that that work can continue. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, hi, thanks for uh, the very nice talk. Um, I had one question because you said that some people don't like the explanations because they think they are wrong. Mm -hmm. Do you think that allowing them to control the system would change some findings you had now? So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you're asking if allowing them more control in the system would kind of ameliorate the problem where they thought the explanations were wrong. Um, I think yes and no. So I think hiding the transparency up front would yes make it less obvious that the system would be making these kind of low level errors. Um, but knowing that in general users will probably ask for an explanation when their expectations are already violated, that means that they'll probably scrutinize those explanations they get even more. And so I think that in general it could improve things a little bit, but it might also make it worse for the population that needs it the most. Does that make sense? Thank you for the talk. I have two quick questions. One is, do you make a distinction between emotion and affect in the way you were, t if, if there was a distinction you made? And the second one is, I couldn't quite make the connection between, let's say, chatbots like Wobot um, and sort of expression of stress and transparency because there's related work that shows that if you're telling someone that they're stressed, sometimes the outcome is they get more stressed. So there is this tension between transparency of these sort of high stakes affect based systems. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on those two things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so th the first question was, is there a different be difference between emotion and affect in the system? Um, so the system was trained on basically what were mood ratings from the other system that we had collected. And it was, my language might have been unclear during the presentation, it was conveyed to users as being basically a rating of the mood of that experience that they had had. Um, the second question was, uh, can you, sorry, can you repeat the second? Well, oh, how does, how does like a chatbot connect to things like this? Um, and I think that's a really good question. So, for example, one of the original kind of inspirations for looking at the system in the context of pulling it out of Emoticale and experimenting with it was all the work that suggests that reflecting on emotional experiences can lead to um, kind of well-being changes in a positive direction. I don't think if we were to actually deploy a system that was trying to get that reflection aspect, you don't want to give negative feedback to the users. Um, so I agree completely with that. In the context of trying to make this more generalizable to other systems and it being a test bed, uh, we had to, you know, violate a little things that would have been, you know, yeah, better for the actual reflection part of it. 